So let's, are you ready to go, Tanari? Yes, let's go. It is, uh, it is time. We wanted to give everyone time to, to come in. We have a lot of people today because... Uh, Our well, special guest. We have a very special guest today, Adrienne Marie Brown, who happens to be here during a very special time. So a lot of our previous webinars have been mostly about just sort of grappling <laughs> in a complete time of despair. And while there is still plenty of despair to go around, the past uh, week and a half especially have given a lot of people a sense of renewed hope in some ways that we weren't expecting to pop up uh, in June, although obviously with tragic roots. So, so yes, yeah, should, we, should we let um, Clayton do our official intro? It would be great. We'll have uh, Dr. Clay Coleman, who is our public scholarship technology consultant, um, begin with our intro and we'll work out a small tech issue at the same time. Awesome. Uh, well, welcome, welcome, welcome. I want to echo Tanana Reeve and uh, Professor Coleman's words of welcome on this Saturday. We thank you so much for joining us here today. We're really excited to get this uh, webinar started. Um, but before we get started, I want to kind of introduce our hosts and our special guest today. So this is the fifth iteration of Octavia Tribe to tell us, um, specifically focused on Parable for Today's Pandemic. It's hosted by the illustrious Tanana Du and Dr. Monica A. Coleman with special guest Adrian Marie Brown. Uh, this webinar is also in partnership with the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Now, before we get started, I think it makes a little bit of sense to give you uh, a general idea of how this time will be spent today. Um, we'll start with introductions. Uh, from there, we'll move on to um, conversation between our panelists. And we'll also then after that transition into a question and answer session, we'll, we will uh, provide some answers to some of the questions that many of you have shared in the registration form. But for those who didn't, please do feel free to share um, information using the hashtag Octavia Tried. Um, this hashtag has been used throughout all of the different Octavia uh, Tried webinar series. So there's an ongoing conversation and you're welcome to join us. We really appreciate that. So without further ado, I wanna start by introducing our guests today, our esteemed panelists. The first um, is Tanana Reeve Du. Uh, Tanana Reeve Du is an award-winning author who teaches black horror and Afrofuturism at UCLA. She's an executive producer on Shudder's groundbreaking documentary, Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror. A leading voice in black speculative fiction for more than 20 years, Dew has won an American Book Award, an NAACP Award, uh, NAACP Image Award, sorry, and a British Fantasy Award. And her writing has been included in Best of the Year anthologies. Her books include Ghost Summer Stories, My Soul to Keep, and The Good House. She and her late mother, civil rights activist Patricia Stevens Dew, co-authored Freedom and the Family, a mother-daughter memoir of the fight for civil rights. She's married to author Stephen Barnes, with whom she collaborates on screenplays. They live with their son, Jason, and two cats. And you can find Tanana Reeve Dew on Twitter at Tanana Reeve Dew. Next, I want to introduce uh, Professor Monica A. Coleman. Dr. Coleman is a professor of Africana Studies at the University of Delaware. She's also an ordained elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She works at the intersection of faith, culture, and social justice. She is the author or editor of six books and several articles and book chapters that focus on the role of faith in addressing critical, social, and philosophical issues. Her book, Making a Way Out of No Way, A Womanist Theology, is required reading at colleges and universities around the country. Her memoir, Bipolar Faith, A Woman's Journey with Faith and Depression, received the Silver Illumination Award in 2017. Dr. Coleman speaks widely on religion and sexuality, religious pluralism, churches and social media, mental health, and sexual and domestic violence. You can find Dr. Coleman at Monica A. Coleman on Twitter. And last, but certainly not least, is Adrienne Marie Brown. Adrienne Marie Brown is a writer. She attended the Clarion Sci-Fi Writers Workshop and the Hedgebook Writers Residency in 2015. 
and Voices of Our Nation in 2014 as part of the inaugural Speculative Fiction Workshop. She was a 2013 Kresge Arts Challenge winner, writing and generating science fiction in and about Detroit. She was the Ursula K. Le Guin, um, Ursula Le, Le Guin Feminist Sci-Fi Fellow and Sundance Time Warner 2016 Artist Grant recipient. Adrian is the author of the Radical Self Planet Help book, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change and Changing Worlds, published by AK Press in 2017. She's also the co-editor of the anthology Octavia's Brood, Science Fiction from Social Justice Movements with Walida Emeresha, published by AK Press in 2015. She has helped to cultivate work and thinking about Octavia Butler and Emergent Strategy, gathering a loose-knit network of people interested in reading Octavia's work from a political and strategic framework. Um, and we are honored to, in this space, join that network of folk. Um, last but not least, we want to give a special thanks to National Museum of Women in the Arts. Uh, you can find them at Women in the Arts on Twitter. Women in the Arts and Social Change is a public program initiative highlighting the power of women in the arts as catalysts for change that launched in October, October 2015. Cultural Capital Program partnerships with leading DC area organizations to connect the museum with new audiences for programs with the cause-driven focus. So without further ado, uh, I want to transition into the space where the conversation happens um, surrounding a parable for today's pandemic. Um, I want to make sure to make another plug for the hashtag Octavia Tribe for all of those on Twitter who want to join in the conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. And I'm just bursting with excitement um, and love and energy to see so many people here to see Adrian's face after so long of not having seen it. Um, so excited that, that this space exists for all of us to come together today. It feels like an important event. Um, and, and this is our fifth one, but, but wow, <laughs> there's so much going on that we need to talk about. And I just wanna say really quickly, I, I don't know what, what you'd like to say, Monica, that, that I, I had the honor of bringing Adrian Marie Brown to Spelman College some years ago as a part of my Octavia Butler celebration of um, at Spelman, and she just lit up the room and and dropped so much wisdom um, and just breathes that energy into everyone. Um, so I'm I'm really excited that we get to share you with everyone else on the Octavia Tried series. And even though we knew you were coming a little while ago, it's like we planned it this way. Um, you know, one of the questions we get a lot as we've been just doing this for the last, what, month or so, has been about leadership and community and what that looks like nowadays and how um, Octavia's work, the free parable of the sower, is going to inspire us for that. And so, um, and that was before we even had a sense. I mean, we knew we were in a pandemic, but we didn't know we were in a season for global social change. Um, and so this makes it even all the more pertinent as, and we're seeing new leadership models than we've had in the past. And I'd love for us to spend some time talking about that. Um, maybe I'd like to uh, give the question, someone asked a question for all of us, and this would be great maybe for Adrian to start off with. Is that okay with you? Great. Um, and that, I think the question was, you know, where are you finding hope? Mm. Um, well, first of all, hey, <laughs> um, Monica, Tanana Reeve, thank you so much for having me, hosting me, um, being on sabbatical. I was on sabbatical for the last six months, and this is the first event that I'm doing, and, uh, and it feels just right to be like, oh, can the first thing I do be talk about Octavia, um, and yeah, hope, um, I think the timing of things is so relevant, but I was on a total social media break for all of May. And then I came back into the realm of the world and, and you know, I had some slight inklings of what was happening, but everyone was keeping me pretty shielded. And so to come back in and be like, oh, like <laughs> when I went offline, it was like pandemic and just the rising death tolls and the terror and, and I was feeling that. And then I, when I re returned, it was like uprising, we're defunding the police. Um, 
it's global. It, there's this feeling of uh, momentum towards justice against police brutality, which feels like it comes directly out of like, oh, this container happened with the pandemic and then this explosion happened where it's like, you know, we're literally doing nothing, a lot of us, but sitting in a place and looking at the situation. And I feel like something happened that inflamed people's courage, that inflamed people's sense of like, oh, this moment matters and what I do in it matters. Um, I have felt really hopeful watching the statues being torn down I have felt really hopeful watching the way that people are communicating. There just feels like there's a, not a singular message, but such an aligned messaging around abolition and defunding and, and not letting anybody um, trick us when it comes to like, oh, who's responsible for what's happening in this moment? Like, you know, the emperor has no clothes. It feels very like, the whole system of white supremacy, the whole system of patriarchy, all of these things are really naked and we can really see what we're dealing with right now. Um, and something that gives me hope is there's this comedian, I think it's Sarah, Sarah Coleman, I think that's her name, I have to check, but there's this comedian who's been making fun of uh, 45 and she does these little skits where she just like basically lip syncs and it's just hilarious. I'm like, the culture is shifting in a way that is really, it's like there's so much humor and laughter and pleasure and dance and song and like that protest feels irresistible right now. And that's always the thing that we're tasked with as artists, as writers who are awake. So lots of hope for me right now. Isn't that beautiful to come back from a sabbatical and just feel the infusion all over the, the world? Yeah, to feel the connection, you know, the first, and I think the patterns, you know, Octavia was such a pattern master and a pattern watcher. And so seeing the patterns flow, like I was in Italy um, in March and had to like get myself out of there. <laughs> but it was like watching these patterns of like watching the pandemic flow as a pattern and seeing, are we capable of turning towards this or not? Are we capable of changing our behavior or not? Which was, she was always asking us, right? It's like, what are you going to do? Are you going to be inside the gate or outside the gate? Are you going to be building with who comes or causing violence or danger? What are you going to do? And so the pandemic asked that question. And I feel like these uprisings have just played into that same pattern. Like, will you do what your community requires and stay in? Will you do what your community requires and go out and fight and disrupt? So yeah, it's, it's amazing. And it's so interesting that you mentioned this, this notion of staying in or going out and community. Exactly. That also <laughs> another one of the questions. Um, in a moment when, especially caring, physical touch, it's one thing to put on a mask and go outside and social distance while you're protesting. That's kind of, obviously, uh, there's a lot of joy in that experience, despite the danger. But so many people have been in quarantine, uh, many in complete isolation at the time they want to see community the most. So in a moment where caring physical touch has become scarce for many, how does that influence the ways you think about change yeah. in Octavia's parables? Well, one of the things, um, you know, I've read the parables many, many times and that, that first whole parable of the sower, so much of it happens in this tiny gated community where they are behind walls, completely isolated from what's happening outside and that going outside is a dangerous thing to do, right? So anytime they leave their gated Robledo zone and go out, they're risking death. We see members of their community die. And that feels very, very prescient, very relevant to this moment, which is, oh, it's not fire starters. It's not, you know, folks who are just gonna necessarily attack us on the street. It's this invisible thing. And yet we have to stay guarded and inside. And some of the things that happen are loneliness. Um, some of the things that happen are a change in how we interact with each other and how we experience each other physically. Um, I think, and we'll, we'll see if time plays this out, but I think that those who had empathy heading into the quarantine and then had to spend an immense amount of time in solitude probably felt, and I know I felt an increase in what I could sensate, uh, you know, like what I could feel without being anywhere close to people. I spent three and a half months 
that's the longest I've ever been in my life with no human contact. Um, and it changed me. I, I was like, oh, I can suddenly feel like when my sister's having a mood shift or my lover's having a moment or, you know, something's happening, I could feel things. And I was like, am I always feeling this? And I just haven't had enough room to feel it. Um, but, you know, having to also learn how do I communicate and love through digital means, right? How do I let this be enough? How do I learn to touch myself in new ways? And, you know, one of the things of pleasure activism, right, is always like pleasure is always available to us in, in our own body. How do we stay in touch with that part of ourselves? Um, but I think that's been a big part of the quarantine. I also think the quarantine has, in the same way that in the parables, the wall really represents who has and who doesn't have. So if you're inside that wall, like you have some level of privilege, protection, safety, even if it's myth, even if it's false. And if you're outside, you don't. And the, the pandemic was like that, right? It was like, if you don't have privilege, you can't quarantine, <laughs> right? You have to be working, you have to be hustling, you have to be out taking those risks. You have to be every day, you know, I think of them biking through that dangerous neighborhood. And I just think of that as like everyone who was, anyone I saw going outside during the pandemic, I was like, oh my gosh, like you're in danger. And there's nothing I can do to stop that because the class warfare is so in effect, right? Um, and then when you're inside, there's a false sense of security which I think now, then the uprising to me was the walls falling down, right? I was just like, there's no security. Like the police will come in your home or they'll come wherever they wanna come. We all have to fight where we stand. And I think the last little piece of this that just keeps resonating with me is like, whoever you're with, that's who you're with. <laughs> so, you know, Octavia always said that you don't know who you're gonna be in the apocalypse with. And I always love that part. Cause it's like, who was on the road? are you down? I don't know your whole analysis. We haven't like talked about our alignment, but like, do you want to live? Me too. Do you know about water? Like what's good? And I felt like the quarantine moment called that in too. It's like, some people were like, you know, I'm stuck here with these three people that I don't know. I'm quarantined now with my family. I'm quarantined by myself. You know, for me, I was like, I'm by myself and I have to navigate getting groceries and all this stuff that, you know, I'm like, hmm, like which, what risk am I willing to take and now I have to trust all these strangers who are just like, you know, um, small interactions, like going to a gas station to get gas and, and being like, okay, I'm going to wait to step out of my car until that person gets back in their car and, you know, oh, they're moving too close to me. Just all this nonverbal assessment and communication has become so necessary to navigate the world now. And you're with who you're with and you have to decide very quickly, can I trust you or not trust you? If I don't trust you, how do we proceed? If you wanna do a different risk level than I do, which is a lot of what Lauren was dealing with early in the book is her brother wants to go out and be free, not have to be behind the walls. And she's like, no, we have to, we all have to stay in here to stay safe. And, you know, being in family, taking different risk levels and seeing all of that play out, it was just, it's just been a very parable time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, that's really what we were thinking when we started this. Like, this is like parable. <laughs> um, yeah. And as you may know, it started from just text exchange. Like, wouldn't it be kind of fun to talk about parable right now? That's the best way to start um, anything, I think. <laughs> right? Because, be you know, fun. we both know it. And it's the first thing that we thought about. Yeah, I love and, this. And I really appreciate how you mentioned, you know, you're with who you're, you know, you, you're with who you're with. And yes. That so much of community, you know, we can't go out, many of us, even if you have to take the risk, you don't want to take more than you have to, right? Exactly. We're not going exactly. out the way we used to, and yeah. especially in community. And so we've gotten a lot of questions about emergent strategy and how <laughs> that applies to this moment, right? How, how are we doing community now? Um, I love this, you know, one of the fears I had when I was sort of stepping back was like, I'm going to become irrelevant because the speed of everything, you know, the speed of the world now, it really feels like you're either in the river or you don't exist. And, um, and you know, all my friends are like, this is not going to happen. Like, you know, you're whatever, but you still have to go through the process. And what I found was coming back that the majority of messages I had were people like we're practicing emergent strategy in this way. And some of the ways that I heard 
were the kind of formations that people were creating amongst themselves. So the, the ideology was like, oh, I have to adapt the formations of my life. So maybe the normal formation of my life is like my home life, my work life, my home life. And there's a community of people who help take care of my children, take care of my uh, food needs, take care of my transportation needs, all this. There's like, oh, these are the structures. And then people being like, oh, I'm adapting the whole structures of my life now so that there's no one else to take care of my kids. I, I it's so interesting talking to parents about how parenting feels you know, during this time and the adaptations of like, I was never planning to homeschool. Like I'm talking to some people who are like, I'm not a homeschool teacher. Like, I don't know how to teach. I don't know how to do this. And watching folks be like, okay, initially denial. We don't know what we're doing. And then, oh wait, there's always a solution. There's always some people working on solution. Now we have the patterns to communicate those solutions. The number of curriculums and resource lists and here's the scaffolding anti-racism stuff and here's what you need to teach your kids this and here's how to talk to your kids about the pandemic. Like every single thing we needed, watching community adapt into fill those spaces and also watching people unveil how much they already had in place. So, you know, emergent strategy really, a lot of it is like looking at what do we pay attention to? And if we're paying attention to how terrifying this moment is, we will be terrified and we will get stuck and we will not be able to move towards survival. And it looks like so many people initially had that terror and still have moments. Like I feel like there'll be moments where you look at the numbers, you look at the, the way the virus seems to be adapting and there's terror, but then you can bring your attention over to like, look at what we're doing. Look at how, Every day at seven o'clock, people are going out to thank the healthcare workers that adapted out of community as this mass, beautiful, celebratory thing. Um, I also saw people really adapting in terms of getting needs met. So mutual aid, you know, watching how people were like, I have some food to redistribute, or I have a lower risk. I can go to the co-op and get food for all the people in the community since it's an eight hour wait in the line. I can take that risk or people figuring out ways to support each other throughout this has been incredible. I also think there's a big piece, like so much about emergent strategy is being able to let go of what is no longer working and not think of it as a failure, but an iteration. And we're in a massive iteration right now where the world is ending. Many worlds are ending. The worlds as we knew them were ending. So I talked to people one generation up who are like, defund the police or abolish this or, you know, like we're all wearing masks now. And it's just like, I can't understand how to, how that could happen so quickly. But those who have been practicing and playing with adaptation with other modes of, of leading and following are like, Oh, of course, this is just the next adaptation. And there's a line that Lauren thinks, and she doesn't say to her father, where he's talking about the world is coming to an end and she thinks, no, your world is coming to an end. And I feel like the emergent strategists right now are able to see there are certain worlds that are coming to an end in this moment. And if you're ready, right, if you've got your go bag of ideas and your go bag of community and your go bag of literal material resources, if you're ready, this is an, an immense time to pivot into the kind of community you want to be in and articulate it. Um, I'll say one practice of emergent strategy that happened in my own family was we all are spread out like many families now, and we often will just talk at holidays and an adaptation we made was we started doing these weekly phone calls of just having to check in, like, how are you doing? How are you surviving the pandemic? How are you? And it led to a much higher level of honesty. Like all of a sudden we were like, well, we should kind of know each other's living will, power of attorney. We should kind of know like what risk levels everyone's at. We should kind of know. And it came out, you know, like I smoke weed and I do this and I do that, like all this stuff. <laughs> Cause it was like, we all need to know what everyone's actually doing, how you're actually living because our adaptations have to be in relationship to what really is not what we project of ourselves, you know? Um, so yeah, those are some of the things, you know, one other thing actually is in the parables, there's this whole 
component about these folks who are just about destruction. And I really think this is an interesting moment where there's like so much coming down, but emergent strategy to me is really like, and how do we grow? Like, what are we creating in the space and with the detritus? And like, how are we part of the composting activity? And there's a warning. I think when I, when I, the first thing I thought when I was like, Octavia tried to tell us was like, don't become obsessed with just destruction. Keep moving towards life. Keep moving towards destiny. Keep moving towards taking root, right? Um, and in this moment, I think that warning is super, super important because so much is falling down that it could be very easy to become obsessed with just the destruction and to say, what else are we tearing down? What else can we burn down? How else can we destroy? And it's like, yes, but, and also towards what building, towards what destiny? Like, where are you taking root in the same moment? Which is, you know, the reason I follow Movement for Black Lives so, so deeply is that it's like, there's a whole platform, there's a whole vision and it's not just tearing down, but it's tearing down for the sake of making room for what we know we need. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that. Especially talking about how we are already adapting. Yes. I think so much, so many of us worry about, oh, I'm not adapting well, but oh, we actually are. Well, we're adapting. all adapting. And, we're all um, adapting. Some people are just adapting to learn to feel more too. Like I have so many people mm -hmm. who are just like, I'm crying all the time now. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Yeah, well, it was always a crisis. It's always been a tragedy. Being able to feel it allows us to then actually make the right adaptations. So, yeah. Right, and these are things we do sometimes not even, you know, hopefully and usually unknowingly. Yes. When my daughter asked, did your mother, did grandma take away your iPad when you were bad? And I was like, oh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I, I just love that. <laughs> about people like my, like my mother, right, who was using the iPad but grew up with, maybe a radio right yeah. and so we we adapt right yes. and sometimes we forget how we can adapt that's right so i really love you pointing that out and um talking about transformation right that we like like you are we're talking about how are we transforming creatively because yeah. we can choose destructive transformation or creative yes transformation. yeah and that both are necessary and you know, even the small adaptations I see, I am so excited about the adaptations away from respectability politics. <laughs> you know, like what protest looks and feels like right now. I saw a video of, um, of the Black Visions Collective in Minneapolis, you know, calling the mayor in to accountability. And it was just sort of like, what a beautiful moment. <laughs> you know, it's confrontational. There's just a lot of like, hey, you either with this, you're going to get it now or not. And I just feel like there's this ratchet, beautiful energy to it. That's like, oh, part of rejecting white supremacy is also rejecting this idea that there's some appropriate way to be for the sake of our survival. And that adaptation has been unfolding and now we get to see a peak um, explosion of it. It just, it, it thrills me. The more people feel like they can actually be whole, whether they're in the streets or with their family or wherever they are, I think the better we all are, we benefit from that wholeness. I, I love that um, that we're talking about movement and activism mm -hmm. at this at this time. Uh, this is what I I wondered what took so long, you know, on some yeah. level. Uh, it's like, but thank goodness it started. And the question of leadership is one that's come up and mm -hmm. one that a lot of us are talking about now. Uh, my late mother, Patricia Stevens Dew. Yeah, with whom I wrote a book called Freedom and the Family, a mother-daughter memoir of the fight for civil rights. I sat at her knees while she told me the lessons from the 60s, and I see so much of it replaying now. There are so many ways to be active. Some people That's can right. march, some people can give money. One thing she talked about a lot, and one of the reasons she wanted to write that book was that she was a bit dismayed at how much emphasis, no disrespect, but yes. it, how much emphasis was placed on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Right. And once and once he was assassinated, <laughs> right? So much of the wind out of the sails for a lot of people, always looking for this top-down leader when that's not what leadership looks like. And one of the great things about what we've seen erupting all over the world is that it's spontaneous yes. and there's no top-down leadership. And it's so ironic that at a time when on the political front, you know, the candidates are not the face of the future, right? They're not the face of progress, but the people 
are creating a mood of progress and propulsion. So how would you address how leadership looks right now and how we can take advantage of this moment? Yeah, you know, I, I see so much that I feel thrilled by. I feel like for the last five, six years, you know, I've gotten the gift of being able to watch Black Lives Matter, Black Youth Project 100, and then the Movement for Black Lives, Black Organizing for Leadership and Dignity, to watch these different formations um, step in and say, oh, what does it mean to hold the center of Black life and to defend Black life and to love ourselves, to assert our right to exist? And how do we build movements that orient and center around that. And to me, it's such a compelling counterforce to those who operate in a very individualistic way, right? Where there's, you know, it's, it's easy now with social media, you can develop a massive following without actually having um, a movement, right? Without actually having accountability or without actually having anybody that you're relating to, to check in with. And it calls that question, you know, Martin Luther King uh, Jr., that, that period of time was so interesting because how people often interpret him was that he was talking about reform in a lot of ways. And he was talking about like this nonviolent reform, but he, it was only possible because he was in relationship with those who were working other strategies at the same time, whether it was a direct relationship or an understanding tension. And I feel like in the same way right now, you know, I, I saw, I came back and I saw all this uproar, like, oh, Doreen McKesson came out with this whole reform, blah, blah, blah. And it was so interesting to me because I was like, yeah, there's individuals who will articulate reformist perspectives, but there's movements who are articulating movement demands that are couched and resourced and coming up from a ton of people. And sometimes it helps to have that like, well, here's one path. We know it doesn't work any longer to keep going down this path. How do we pivot? And, and I feel like, you know, you said it's spontaneous. I think it's interesting because I feel like movement is rarely spontaneous. For me, I'm like, we create uh, conditions and we create um, the skill set to take opportunity seriously. And that's what I see happening is there's a spontaneous, there's a movement of rage and anger and combustion. And then there's all these organizers and leaders who are willing to look at that and say, we see the opportunity and we're going to move in and we're going to uplift that. And I want to uplift a couple of people um, that have recently been in the New York Times articulating from movement right, what I feel like is perspectives of leadership. So one is um, Miriam Kaba, who is an abolitionist leader, a great teacher of mine. And um, she just put a piece in there called, Yes, We Mean Literally Abolish the Police. And it's New York Times, gorgeous, powerful piece that really lays out for people when we say defunding the police, what we what does abolition actually look like in this time and what are the community alternatives what are the solutions that people at a local level will have to pick up leadership to me means she's not coming from some theoretical idea of what should happen she's looking at here are the community experiments that have been happening here's how they've gone based on how these have gone we can start to make a hypothesis for how we move to the next step how we grow this um, Tinjiwe uh, McHarris and her brother wrote a piece for the New York Times that was, um, I'm like, what was it called? No More Money for the Police. I believe that's what it was. And it was also the same thing of like, if someone continues to not do their job well, at what point do you redistribute that budget to things that can work? And it's interesting because movement calls the question, usually from a place of not very popular now, not a very popular stance, right? As your mother saw, like during the civil rights movement, which we look back and we romanticize, it was like, obviously everyone knew that that was wrong. It was like, no, no, no. A tiny percentage of people were doing that work while the majority of humans that were in the country at the time were like, that's too much, that's wrong, that's too big. Similarly now, there's so many people pushing and there's still people who are like, don't destroy the neighborhood, you know, like don't do, and it says, or what do we do if we don't have the police? And movement leaders are there to say, are they working? You can also see that they're not working. If an experiment fails, you don't double down on the experiment, right? If an experiment fails, you say, what are the adaptations that are needed to create a new experiment? And Miriam Kaba's piece does a beautiful job of saying from the very 
beginning, the inception of police, that has been a failing experiment. It has failed many ways with many different, you know, adaptations and constructs. We try putting videotapes on them. They don't care if they're being filmed. They're still going to kill people. Like, so that adaptation, that, that experimentation fails. Then we say, oh, what are the other experiments? And a leaderful movement has many experiments that are happening that are localized. The thing that has been so exciting to me about these uprisings is that they're very localized. The culture of each city, of each place, determines the kind of uprising they have. And that will determine the kind of demands that they can make. So in Minneapolis, they have a city council that is progressive enough to make a call to defund the police. And they are like, okay, we're going to enter in that battle. That may not happen in North Carolina, right? That may not happen in other places. So in other places, they're going to have to define for themselves. What is our leadership capable of, right? Now, Durham has been, they've been, you know, Raleigh Durham has been like moving their local government as well. They might be able to do something there's other places, you know, I look at Detroit where I'm like, I don't know that we'll be able to do that move. So what are, what are our experiments? How do we intern, in, increase the amount of mediation? How do we increase the amount of social work responders? How do we increase the amount of funding that's able to move to these other places? And each thing builds off of each, each thing, right? So you don't think it's possible till you see someone do it. Right. Someone's got to be first. But then once you see it done, a major city in the U.S. is defunding the police. It's now done. You can't tell me it can't be done. I always think of the, the lunch counter sit ins. I'm like, you can't tell me a black and a white person can't sit at a lunch counter. I just saw it. We have to do actions like that are like that. Right. Where it's like it may start symbolically. Eventually it shifts. I also think leadership helps with our cynicism. You know, we live in, a, in capitalism. And so corporations are all rushing right now. They're like, oh, wait, now, is this the trend? Is it, is it like Black Lives Do Matter now? Okay, it took a little bit, but we're here, we got it. We came up with a little, you know, whatever. And our cynicism can just immediately reject that. Just like, look at these, whatever. Everybody's trying to say something. But leadership also helps us turn and say, that's culture shift, right? Capitalism doesn't actually get to claim all of our work. We are the ones who are shifting the culture and now we keep pushing people. You said that, now we, get, we have something we can hold you accountable to. You said you care about black lives. We use that to push your budget, to move your policy, to change your practices. Before you hadn't even articulated it. In fact, you had articulated the opposite, right? I think it was the Starbucks was like, nobody can wear black lives things in here. And now they're like, we've made a uniform, right? So it's like, okay, now you've, you've made this step as we, tear capitalism down, which is also one of my passions. I'm like, actually, how do we get to post-capitalism? As we make those moves, how do we sh keep shaping a culture that makes it irresistible to be on the side of Black life, irresistible to be on the side of trans life, right? We want that to be the culture that corporations have to get with, and governments have to get with, and actresses have to get with. Anyone who's in the public sphere, anyone who's a boss of anyone else, we want to set a culture where it's irresistible to do the right thing. So beautifully put as is everything you say, and so inspirational, and you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. It's, it's people who have been in the communities doing the work, the research, the lonely walk, yeah. right? Because when my mother started her, her core chapter in college, it was her and her sister and a couple other people, and you know that's how it is and movement spaces, you have long-term work over time, and then something happens, whether it's something in the media, yeah. or in this case, a tragic police killing, several, a string, really, of tragic police killings all around the same time during a pandemic that creates the illusion of spontaneity, but yeah. actually it's people who have been laying down that groundwork. Um, I yeah. remember, it seems like the day before yesterday, Black Lives Matter uh, was was like a, a curse, you know, in terms of the way it was discussed in the media. Exactly. And, and a terrorist group. And I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not, it was not a game, right? Right. And, and, <laughs> and, you know, it's like, that's what was happening in the public realm. And what was happening, you know, as someone who was like facilitating in that space, it was like, and it really had impact, you know, philanthropy, right? It was like, we can't touch that, right? We will step back from from anything that is actually associated with Black Lives Matter because of this. Now the pivot, oh, how do we, 
how do we get our resources? How can we be seen as getting our resources into the right place? I'm like, sure, whatever it takes. I think the leadership in this moment is also use this moment to do better in the next moment, right? So like right now, trans people's rights are being stripped away. And it's like, how do we quickly make this pivot instead of making black trans people struggle and fight and take five years to culture shift the movement to get on board, right? How do we understand that like when we pivot our attention to those who are at the most intersectional oppression, when we pivot our attention and bring it to those who have the most need for it, that's when our movement shines. That's when we actually are bringing the resources to transform the material conditions in real time. And all black people have been saying is we need the attention to be on this, you know, this is this intersection has gotten so dangerous. We can't survive this. Black trans people are, are saying the same thing right now. And let's make it culturally unacceptable to be transphobic in this moment, right? Let's make it, oh, the movement culture is, we understand that trans, trans people and black people and all of us, <laughs> our lives all matter. That's how the, that's what nature says. That's not what I determined, but nature, says each of these lives is miraculous and can never be created again. And each of these breaths matters and each of these deaths is going to be an escalation. Yeah. I mean, that, that what you're talking about really is also, not only have people been doing this for a, a while, right, on the ground in these local places, yeah. um, but because we got people who've been doing this, the question always arises of, how, right? How do we keep ourselves okay while yeah. we do this really, I mean, work that is literally about dehuman, you know, humanizing what people have dehumanized, like asserting your own humanity. So the question, we get really great questions about um, spirituality and envisioning practices that sustain, not just people who are kind of on the front lines, but all of us who are trying to imagine a new future. Yeah. So can you, we talked about this a little bit in previous webinars, but we'd love to hear you talk about, yes. you know, what are those practices that we have to engage in, yeah. you know, to continue to imagine? That's great. Um, a couple of things leap to mind. You know, I think that there's so many different ways that we can feed our spirits, feed ourselves. Um, last year, so before I went on sabbatical, I, had, I, I wrote emergent strategy and then wrote, wrote Octavius Brood, we edited that and then did Emergent Strategy and then did Pleasure Activism. And while Pleasure Activism was coming out, Emergent Strategy was trying to figure out how, we, how do we give people room to learn Emergent Strategy outside of crisis conditions, like in community with each other. So we did these 10 massive events around the country while also trying to move the Pleasure Book out. And those events were spiritual food for me watching people get to be with each other, practicing adaptation. It was outstanding to me that when people gathered and were given enough room, it was just like, what are the things that your community needs? What's the medicine? What do you have? They always came up with ritual. They always came up with song. They always came up with circle. They always came up with conflict re resolution as a community rather than taking it off to the side. It was like, how do we hold it and bring it to the center and attend to it with love? They always recreated the space to have healing stations and like little apothecaries out of their bags. It was outstanding to see the patterns that we do know how to care for each other and for ourselves when we're given a little bit of room. So all of that was flowing. And then I went on sabbatical and I tried another move around taking care, which is staggering. I think of it as staggering. After a year like that, where I put out a ton that I needed to go and cocoon and kind of figure out, okay, how do I not get, how do I not try to keep scooping something out of the bottom of an empty cup and call that a contribution? And I think a lot of folks are doing that now. And one of the ways I think we keep imagining is literally imagining ourselves into a further future, which means organizing as if we're going to be here a long time, rather than organizing as if we're only gonna be here till tomorrow. And that means we stagger, you know, sometimes you go and you're at the front line and then you need to have enough people so that you can go rest and fall back and take a nap <laughs> or take a break, take a sabbatical. 
you know, I was away and I kept feeling like, is it okay for me to be away? I kept laughing because everyone says, you know, the world's not going to fall apart just because you stop to rest. And literally as soon as I stopped to rest, it was like, there's a pandemic and, and now there's an uprising and um, trying to justify to myself, is it okay to be away? What kept coming back was like, yeah, look how thick the community is. There's facilitators, there's writers, there's leaders, there's, there's so many people. And it's not that I'm not needed, but it's that my rest is okay. Like, and I will come back rejuvenated. And so I keep saying that to people as I return. And I think I may actually do like a, just a little bit more of a sabbatical report back type thing at some point of how do you do micro sabbaticals? Like how do you create, even if you're like, okay, I only have a day. How in a day do you give yourself what you need for some restoration? Because I think a lot of times when people do get a chance to unplug, it's straight to like binging TV while high or something. And it's like, is that the most restorative thing? It might be. It definitely, for me, some days are like, that's the most restorative thing. But it's also, where does meditation come in? Where does yoga or moving your body in certain ways come in? Where does giving yourself room to grieve come in? A huge amount of a sabbatical is spent crying. <laughs> and I challenge anyone to, to contest that. But I'm just like, for me, it's going and being like, oh, I didn't have room you know, to cry. And when I heard about George Floyd, I had room to cry. When I heard about Breonna Taylor, I had room to cry, which I think strengthens whatever offer can come back out from that. I also think this is a big moment of giving ourselves permission to be the ones who are imagining the next phase, which is scary. It's so much easier to say, we live in this world that someone else imagined for us and doesn't it suck? And we can just critique it. And there's a lot of comfort that comes from that power under of just like, well, the world is just crap and there's nothing to be done. And it's just like, look how bad it is. And you can spend, I mean, like social media, maybe 80% of it can be that if you don't follow the right people. It's just look how bad it is. And also these people are a mess and this person did wrong and, you know, ridiculing and just cynic cynicism. Or you can, again, bring your attention to what am I contributing? What do I see that matches that contribution, that nourishes that contribution, that feeds that contribution? How can I put myself into a space where then my contribution begins to shape the entire future? And now I'm starting to take myself very seriously. You know, like I'm like, oh, I thought emergent strategy was a somewhat ridiculous idea even as I was creating it. And I was like, I don't know if people are really gonna wanna pay attention to ants and bees and understand how, you know, mushrooms can teach us. And now I'm like, oh, people do, great. So I didn't know that pleasure activism would resonate with people, but now it's really shaping, you know, I get so much feedback from people that, it, and again, it's like, I didn't create that. Audre Lorde was talking about this and I, I picked up a lineage and I was like, let's bring the lineage current. There's other lineages that need to be brought current um, as well. But now I'm like, I'm grateful to see that the movement feels more permission to feel good while you're in it. And now I'm like, what are the next ideas I wanna take very seriously? You know, somaticization of the body feels very important to me. How do we start to feel as a direct way of pushing back against capitalism? Because capitalism wants us to numb and purchase and numb and purchase. And one of the ways you break that is by saying, I can actually feel, and when I feel I'm satisfied and I don't need to buy anything, you know, and actually often when I feel I want to give, when I feel generosity emerges. So things like that, where I'm like, you can do that in five minutes a day. You can take five minutes and just think, how do I break my relationship with capitalism today? And then do it, right? So I think about that as like, what is the future that you want to shape? Who are you practicing that future with? If it's your family, your quarantine pod? your community, you know, your city. And when you start to imagine getting more concrete, what are the policies that would support what you're imagining? So it's not just like, everyone's got a garden. It's like, uh-huh, how do we do that? How do we be in right relationship to land and the indigenous people of the land and being someone who's brought to the land? How does everyone garden in the right way? Have those hard conversations. Imagination 
also allows us to have really good hard conversations. That's another thing Octavia was showing us, right? I, mean, I really appreciate your balance between talking about rest, right? And, act, and the, the individual choices we can make and all yeah. of those are necessary, yeah. right? For our activism. Absolutely. Um, you know, when I wrote about Octavia Butler, almost, I guess about almost 20 years ago, working on my dissertation. Yeah. Not that long. I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> right? That young I, yeah, yeah. But you know, I talked about her as a savior yeah. and it really blew my committee away. Cause I was like, well, what makes you think there's only one savior? Right, yeah. or that saviors can't take sabbaticals, right? Exactly. <laughs> or that, exactly. you know, it's about the community exactly. and whoever rises up to lead at whatever time, exactly. but you can't save for long if you don't take a break. Exactly. Um, and so and think I think long term, you know, we also, it's so ingrained in our system, especially as Black people, that it's like we're not meant to live very long. And uh, so when we do, it's like an, ex you know, it's like, whoa, that person got to be old. <laughs> but generally for such, I mean, like, I read Segu uh, while I was on my break, uh, the Maurice um, Conti book, and it's mm -hmm. all about slavery kind of predating European slavery practices. And something about it just blew my mind. I was like, oh yeah, like <laughs> we've been, and we will continue to create these systems for each other where we can't create or we can't stop or we can't and then there will be people who come along who shine a light on another path or shine a light on another way and if we drop our complexity at any point we won't be able to shine the light well you know octavia i felt like she did that all the time she was like it's complex it's not an easy answer saviors also usually have vices they have you know issues they have drawbacks yeah. The more vulnerabilities. We break, vulnerabilities, you know, um, for me, it has allowed me to actually be a leader because for such a long time, I was like, I can't be a leader. You know, I like to have fun. It really was, like, I was just like, I like to have fun and I like to read sci-fi. Like, that's not a leader. I'm not serious enough. And now I feel very much like, oh, like my leadership is this. It's an invitation to aliveness. It's an invitation to play that doesn't discount grief. And I don't take myself too seriously. Like if I need to step away, I trust that there's, there's others coming. I also, I'm not sure where this all fits in, but there's some things you can teach and there's some things that can only be learned through experience. And I feel like this is one of those beautiful moments where it's like, you know, I have been a part of trainings, been to and taught and done all this stuff. You can develop people. But then there's something that happens when people are like, oh, this is a moment. And I went out to the street and I figured it out. And no one trained me. And I think there's that balance is as important as the balance between rest and activity is like what can get developed and what you have to go through to learn it yourself. Adulting, I think, is all the things that no one could save you from. You know, your parents tried to protect you or whatever but then they couldn't because the world. So then all of a sudden you had to figure it out for yourself. And that's when you took a leap. And this is a moment where a ton of white people are having this experience of like, oh, this is real. How do I orient towards it? A ton of young black people, a ton of young people of color, a ton of young trans people. There's so many people learning now in real time. I think part of our work as movement leaders is to be a receptive place for all of those folks to move towards so that it's not just a one-time action or activity and learning all this stuff and then not having anywhere to go with it because more advanced movement people kind of shame you about what you don't know or how you're not woke enough or whatever. I think about this a lot. You know, again, Octavia was like, let's just begin at the beginning of Earth Seed, <laughs> right? How do you feel about having a destiny? And I think that question for me, that comes to mind a lot. When I look at all these folks who are stepping in, they're like, how do I help? And it's like, take yourself very seriously as someone who has a destiny to help first. You're not, um, how, you're not late to the movement. You know, whenever you get here, you made it, great job. And like, then how do we find a right, a good place for you to end up?
That is beautiful, beautifully put as usual. We are close on our time, but I, I can't let you go without asking one question that is near and dear to me as a writer. And I also know you as a writer, so I'm not going to put pressure on you and ask if you were writing during your sabbatical. <laughs> but <laughs> I will say that I think for me, the arts is a very important aspect of managing empathy, right? Yes. Because you, you don't want to go numb. Yeah. What I have felt myself go numb, you know, yeah. by the time George Floyd got here, I was a little bit numb. You know, yeah. I've been, I've yeah. been watching these hashtags for a very long time, whereas some people were just noticing the hashtags, exactly. right? So in what way would you say that either for you personally, or do you advise people to use creation yeah. and arts as a way to help manage empathy so that we can be aware without going numb? Absolutely. It's huge to me. It's everything. So I was writing my whole sabbatical. I was like, I'm writing musicals and poems and songs and plays and this and that. I mean, like all kinds of forms were flowing through. But when I'm grieving, song is almost always the first thing that comes to me. And it may be a song that is a, that feels original, you know, like I'm like, it's coming through. Or it may be a song that comes, and I'm like, oh, I remember this song. And I find myself being creative about using things that have existed and remaking them too. Um, gospel, like old school gospel songs, like finding ways to reclaim them um, for myself as a queer person has been really helpful. You know, like sometimes I just need his eye to be on the sparrow, <laughs> you know, and I just, that's what's going to soothe me and touching into whoever created that song and transforming along the time wave of like, okay, let me let that thing transform so that it can come through me and comfort me in this moment. Um, I have found that there's a lot of ways of creating that I, I hadn't thought about as creation before, but I've seen during this pandemic period, people have been creating togetherness. So it's like, I might create a song or I might create a piece of writing. And I notice that there's journaling, which helps me manage some of my empathy, but there's also a reaching out and sharing like, Here's a feeling I just had. It came through in a song and I shared it. And in that way, you know, where two or more are gathered, we, we are able to understand and validate the empathy and validate the feeling. And then we're more, you know, people found ways to create circle, healing circles, holding circles, grieving circles. People have created ways to do funerals at a distance. People have created so many ways to be together. And I think that's one of the most fundamental things we can be doing right now. And then of course, to me, visionary fiction is, is all of our responsibility in a way. Um, I think about the way Lorraine Hansberry wrote where she would take things that were happening in her life and just slightly tweak them um, to play with them and write them. And I keep inviting that in April, I did a Pando Remo where I just asked people to, I posted a prompt each day and was like, write something, fiction, poetry, create some art. And so much came out that it was like, we're all feeling like lonely and scared and overwhelmed and lost. And it just helps so much to be like, oh, that's not just me. I'm not individually fragile and overwhelmed. We as a human species are fragile and overwhelmed. And once we acknowledge we're all feeling that, we can kind of drop the guard that keeps us from letting us attach. You know, this is where I leap from the parables over into um, the Pattern Master series. But I think about how, for me, the solution to this moment is being able to attach in that pattern. And that comes from that vulnerable, empathic understanding, which we can, those pathways can be made of songs, they can be made of dances. D Nice opened up pathways for us, you know, where it's like, oh, we need, I didn't know that I needed everyone to be dancing to Sister Sledge together, but I needed it to, me and Michelle Obama, personally, we just needed to be dancing together to Sister Sledge, that was what I needed, you know? So I think it's really important. I, I keep telling people, especially if you're feeling numb, especially if you're feeling overwhelmed and you can't hear another thing, to, to just be like, okay, well, what would it look like to make a haiku out of that particular feeling, right? Numb is good protection, numb, numb means something, right? And if you follow numb, you usually get to overwhelm. Overwhelm leads you to rage. Rage leads you to heartbreak. Heartbreak leads you to something's got to change. And so it's like, don't give up on, on pursuing yourself. 
beautiful. Don't give up on pursuing yourself. Yeah. All right. Are we at time? Yeah, Monica, did you want to uh, lead us out? Oh. I, have a, I have an announcement. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, we are, um, I mean, thank you so much. We've, I'm just overwhelmed and grateful for you sharing um, everything you're talking. I'm like, yes, the pattern master, I see this, right? Um, and so all of us Octavia fans here are just got every cylinder going and everyone else is like probably Amazoning her books or something right now or looking for your local black bookstore online. Yes, yeah, so um, I help akpress.org, buy it directly from the publisher mm-hmm. or from the source bookstore in Detroit, which is my little black owned publisher. They'll send it, I mean, black owned bookstore, they'll send it anywhere. You know, I'm a Michigander too. I grew up in Ann Arbor. So Okay. All right. <laughs> I see you. Yes. All right. So <laughs> <You're best. laughs> but, but we we really want to thank everyone for the time. I'm feeling even more inspired than I was before. As you know, this is what Tanana Reeve and I do for inspiration. Right? Isn't this so is, good? Yeah. This is what gives us hope and joy in this season to just be able to offer this to everyone. I'm so um, glad you're doing it. I know you do have something very special that you're going to talk about in a second, but uh, Dr. Uh, Qu- yeah. is going yep. to introduce it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, he's got a slide for you. <laughs> sure do. Ready. Um, before I get into that, I do want to say as a person who's been sitting in the audience, I, I am grateful for the chance to have such a delicious and thick conversation um, that adapts to the moment that we're in right now. And this has been a wonderful um, series of webinars that have done that. And you have, in a lot of ways, spoken to a lot of people's feelings. Um, That question about what does it mean to live ourselves, to love ourselves and to assert our right to exist and feel and be and imagine um, and and to connect mutualistically um, means so much, especially in this time. Um, So what I want to do now is give you a chance to talk about the work that you are doing um, and the surprise that you have. And I'm going to go ahead and pull up this slide. Okay. Here you go. It is a slide. All right. So, <laughs> um, so two things. One, I'm really glad you shared that. That's my blog link, adrianmariebrown.net. And I recently posted like my first reflections back from the sabbatical, but at the bottom is a set of resources. So if you really are just like, I don't know where to go or what to do, this is an intersectional moment. So there's no person who will not benefit from investing some time and energy into what Movement for Black Lives is trying to do and to undoing your racism and to defunding the police. So there's resources there. And then the big is that uh, Toshi Regan, who y'all had on as a guest also in this series, Toshi and I also bounce back and forth, talk about Octavia, and we're just like, we're so in love with her. And we thought that this moment would be the perfect moment to actually do a podcast that is basically a read along of the parable of the sower and the parable of the talents um, going chapter by chapter in depth with, um, so we're starting a podcast. We're starting a podcast, it's called Octavia's Parables and it's chapter by chapter in depth looks at what is the summary of what happens in each chapter. And then what is the analysis that brings it current, right? So that we understand like the relevance from each chapter for this moment. And then what are some questions? So we're really encouraging people to read it again if you've read it before, read it in groups, be book clubby about it, or at least ask yourself the questions like, what is in my personal go bag? And is the go bag theoretical or have I actually created one? Like if I needed to meet people on a path towards freedom, what are the things that I would look for to assess if I could trust or not trust them to join community with me? Like really getting into some of those pieces that we all need to contend with. The timing of this feels relevant because 2024 is when we pick up inside of Octavia's parables. And so the election we're heading into now in 2020 shapes the foundational conditions for the moment they pick up on in 2024. And so we're going to be launching the podcast on Octavia's birthday on June 22nd uh, this summer. And then we're going to run it every single week through the election, one chapter at a time. And if you want to support the work, um, which we don't need a lot of support, but just we're covering the work of the editor and the art that we're going to be using. We got Krista Franklin to give us one of her pieces of original collage art um, of Octavia Butler's work to use as our 
podcast art. So things like that. Patreon.com slash O Parables. And then we're on Twitter at O Parables. Um, so June 22nd, look for us. There'll be a trailer sometime before that. But they're vigorous, rigorous conversations. And I think that people really enjoy them. I know I'll be listening. <laughs> Well, it's just a so dance funny. with this. Like it feels so in conversation with this. So I'm like, so I'm like, oh, we're just all recognizing that Octavia, you know, it's like imagining her having all these tentacles that are moving out to hold us in a lot of different ways now. And this is one of them. So And I will also say I'll be listening too. So thank you so much. Oh good. I'm thank you. We got two it. listeners. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll have more than that. Oh yeah, most certainly. <laughs> I just hit follow on Twitter. Oh, yeah. I know. I was like, oh, they're already on Twitter. It's like, so we're already on Twitter. Yeah. You know, I was like, I can do this. I can figure this out. Uh, <laughs> that is amazing. Awesome. Um, I also want to give uh, Dr. Coleman and Tanana Rivdu a chance to talk about the work that they'll be doing as well. Yay. So I'll, I'll just intro real fast for background. Uh, when Monica and I started this series of webinars, we were just very enthusiastic and excited. So we ended up doing five in about seven weeks <laughs> and we can't keep up that pace. So we are going to be scaling back uh, these free webinars to about once a month, you know, which is more of the pace, but we, we have started something new for people who want more contact than that and different contact Ooh. than that. We are starting a group called Saving Ourselves, Shaping oh. Change Workshop, um, hopefully honoring Adrian, uh, your, your subtitle in Emergent Strategy. I love um, that. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't want to um, hog it all. If, if you want to jump in, Monica. Yeah, we're, if you were with us last week, we, we, one thing we talked about was no one is coming to save us and we are going to be saving ourselves. That's right. Um, and so we really wanted to be able to create community. Everyone's asked, you know, the webinars are so large, we can't keep the chat on, we, we're just overflowing. So we wanted to have a more intimate environment where we could have conversation, you could talk with other people who are thinking about the same things. Um, and we'll talk about seven steps of Octavia's method for shaping change. Uh, there'll be an e-journal and super cool sign-up bonus courtesy of Tanana Reeves knowing Octavia, which is a recording of an interview with Octavia yes. Butler. So how can I find out about that? Great question. So <laughs> <laughs> just go to OctaviaWebinar.com. You'll see it there. OctaviaWebinar.com will get you where you need to go. Yeah, so it's it's an additional, so in addition to the, the one free one we do, it's an, it's an additional one where you're part of our, our monthly uh, program, and we have a social media page, and some folks have already signed up, so we're interacting with them, and we welcome you. Check it out anyway at www.octaviawebinar.com, and, and it starts next Saturday, June 20th, with our first uh, live webinar under this program, so, so. I'm just, I'm just full already after today, Adrian. I cannot thank you enough. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks for having me. This was a really beautiful reentry. I filled up my, I, I was taking notes the whole time and, and wanting to live tweet you, but I, I, I can't do it fast enough to keep up with, with all the gems. So uh, just thank you. Watch the replay, people, and then <laughs> get it all down. But thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much to Dr. Coleman and, and, and the university for all of your assistance with this and all of you who, who have many other things you can be doing on a Saturday afternoon. We're so grateful that you spent it with us. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank y'all so much. I am deeply, deeply honored to have gotten to be with you. Um, thanks to all the folks who are working behind the scenes to make this a seamless conversation. And thanks to everyone who showed up. Love y'all. All right. So be it, see to it. Great. Thank you, everyone.